Awesome, man. I'm excited to be here with you guys. I'm almost over jet lag. Almost. Um, between 11 o'clock in the morning and 2 o'clock in the afternoon, my brain doesn't work. Um, whether I'm asleep or awake, it just doesn't seem to work because it's whatever time in the morning over there. And Then uh, between 11 o'clock at night and 2 in the morning here, my brain works just fine. And I uh, hope I'm not awake, but sometimes I am. That's how it is. So super awesome. Um, but that's that's part of the deal. Some of you have never been overseas. You don't know what it's like. You go over there and your body gets changed on a different clock and then you just messed up. It's like, oh, here's dinner. You want some food? You're like, no, nah, I'm not really hungry. And then three o'clock in the morning, it's quesadillas. <laughs> like that's what's got to happen. That's just real life, you know? And uh, you're like, man, maybe I'm eating better. You know, I'm just going to eat a little salad, you know? Nope. Three o'clock in the morning, chili pepper it is. That's how it goes. So Anyway, keep praying for me if you pray for me, and if you don't pray for me, please start praying for me, and if you don't want to, and you want to go to heaven, pray for me, because the Lord told me if you don't pray for me, you're not going to heaven. That's not true. Um, If you're a first-time visitor and this seems weird, it's because I'm jet-lagged and I say weird things when I'm jet-lagged, so let's pray, and we'll see what we can do with the Bible. Probably be a lot better than my intro, so. Father, thank you so much for this night and for every person who's here. Thank you for worship. Lord, we love your presence. Minister to us through your word as we begin this series. Let us start to catch the spirit of it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, how many people have ever spent time with friends and uh, especially when you were younger and you start to pick up some of their habits or mannerisms? Like you start to laugh like them. Have you ever noticed that? I, I find it interesting when I meet adults with obnoxious laughs. It's like you've had your whole life to work that out. Like literally, you, your family and friends do not love you. Or they just love you too much to let you continue. Like when I hear people laughing like that in restaurants and stuff, I literally turn my chair around. I'm like, and when you look at them, they look like they're in shock. Like, why are you looking at me? It's like, come on. You wanted the attention, now you got it. You know what I mean? Turn your chair around and clap for them. And then all of a sudden, they don't want the attention. You know, that, you know what I'm talking about, right? Some of you are probably thinking, well, you're talking about me. Well, knock it off. Grow up. Be an adult. You could change your laugh. Did you know that? Don't get all sad tonight. What, you, I've only been gone a week. Like, all of a sudden, you guys are like, why are you being mean to us? Well, you have a dumb laugh. Um, my son, Levi, when he was little, one day he started stuttering. And the little boy across the street that he played with, he was little, probably five, six That kid stuttered. I said, oh, hell no. Get over here, bro. We don't stutter. Knock it off. We don't talk like that. And his mom was like, no, you know. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. He learned how to stutter in a day. He's going to unlearn how to stutter in two seconds. So you don't stutter, bro. I said, if you want to hang out with your friend, you don't talk like him. If you keep talking like that, you don't get to hang out with him ever again. And everybody's like, well, would you be so mean? Um, Communication's important. Did you know that in your life? It's it's an important part of life and if you're going to be successful. And uh, I was like, no, my kid ain't going to stutter. He was just copying the kid across the street. You pick up mannerisms. Be careful who you hang out with. You will start to be like them. What they think is normal, you will think is normal. Are you here? You start hanging out with weirdos. You do weirdo stuff. You get around normal people and they think you're weird. And then you're like, what's wrong with them? What's wrong with you? So those of you with kids, make sure you pay attention to what your kids are doing. I remember I was in fifth grade. Never forget it. My dad took me to buy shoes. And we went to Payless. How many people went to Payless shoes growing up? Yep. We went to Payless. My dad's like, pick out some shoes. So I went over. And some of you remember these. Some of you young people wouldn't have no idea what I'm talking about. But I picked these gummy soft shoes. With, they were black with like the gummy soles. I said, yeah, I'm going to get these. My dad said, well, you put those back, boy. You ain't wearing them. It's gang shoes. I didn't even know what gang shoes were. I was like, what are you talking about? This is what all my friends wear. My dad said, you ain't wearing them shoes. Them gang shoes. And I realized 10 years later, all my friends were in gang. <laughs> but I didn't know that. All I knew is those were the shoes my friends wore. So those were the shoes that I wanted to wear. I'll never forget seventh grade. I asked my mom if I could wear a hairnet. Now, you guys do not remember that, but old school gangsters in Yuma. My mom was like, what do you want to wear hairnet for? I said, so I could get the waves. My dad was like, we need to think about where we're sending this kid to school, you know? And I want to, later, I want to look back and tell him, you need to think about where we live, bro. 
Like I went to school where we live. You're the one who put us in that neighborhood. But my mom didn't let me wear a hairnet. And so I don't have the waves that I wanted, but you know, whatever. But you'll copy your friends. Who you hang out with will determine who you are. It determines how you see yourself. It has a lot to do with your identity. We're starting a series tonight on identity. And, and it, it, it affects how you see yourself, guys. If you hang out with people that go to the gym all the time, then you think this is what people look like and this is how people behave. If you hang out with people who are investors and are always investing money and saving money and doing smart things with their money, then you think that's normal. You become like that. If you hang out with losers, I brought you here tonight to tell you that you can hang out with some winners and become a winner because it hasn't been your experience up to this point. Are you here? Who you spend your time with and what you focus on will greatly affect your identity and your self-esteem. Today we have many young people who have been raised to have good self-esteem without a reason. You're the best. You're mommy's little angel. You're a champion. It's like that champion ain't never brought home no medal. Not the participation one. The one where you stand on the top. That's what champions do. Are you here? If you have never brought home the hardware, you are not a champion no matter what mama said. Mama's a liar. Mama gonna keep you broke. You got to win the medal if you wanna be a champion. If you're gonna be a champion, you gotta bring home the hardware. You wanna be the best, you have to win. You have to be better than somebody else. You don't get to do nothing and tell us that you're the best. Cause my mom said, I, and I'm here to tell you your mama's wrong and she lied. Now she might have, she's telling the truth if she talks about your potential but there's a whole bunch of homeless people with a lot of potential. Potential doesn't mean anything if it's not realized or actualized. And you should never have self-esteem beyond anything that you've ever done unless you're in the process of learning to do what you believe you're called to do. Did you get that? So, man, I believe that God created me for something great. If you tell me that, I can believe you even if you've never done anything. As long as you're living a life that's preparing you to do something. But don't tell me God called you to be great and you ain't doing nothing. Because I'll say God might have called you, but you have not picked up the phone. You have to answer the call. Amen. So you'll feel good about yourself if you accomplish some things. Young men, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I had, I had five teenagers living with me um, when I was young in ministry. And, and no, they were not my children. They were troubled teens who came to live in my troubled home. And one of them was 21 years old, and he didn't have a job. He was one of those real melancholy type of guys, you know. And I would come home from work and sit down, and he'd say, yeah, man, I'm just really depressed, you know, I'm bummed out. I said, get a job. He's like, why do you always say that? I said, because man was created to work. Work is part of the blessing. It's part of the design. Work was a part of the Garden of Eden before the fall of man. It was not part of the curse. The goal isn't to not work. The goal is to always work. You know those people who retire and stop working die? And people who retire and start working at what they feel like doing live? You were not created to do nothing. And so this young guy was so mad, I said, get a job, get a job, get a job every day. Tell him, get a job, get a job, get a job, get a job. And he was so sick of it that he finally got a job. Two days later, he wasn't depressed anymore. And he became a firefighter. Guys, we were made to work. If you want to feel good, do something worth feeling good about. I know a lot of you probably don't like Andrew Tate. I like some of the things he says. One of the things he says is, you sit around smoking weed, playing video games all day, doing nothing. And the only reason you don't recognize that you have a crappy life and feel bad about it is because you're smoking weed. He said, if you stop smoking weed, you'd say, wow, this is the most boring, stupid waste of a life, but the weed keeps you stupid. Well, it's legal now. It is legal for stupid freaking people who want to not recognize that you got a crappy life. It's Saturday night, but it's not Friday night. Let's go now. Are you here? So you might say, if I smoke weed, am I going to go to hell? No. But if you go to heaven, you might be a little embarrassed compared with your potential and your reality. 
Weed helped my, I, I don't know how I got on weed, but I'm on it. Weed, I smoke weed because I have anxiety. Well, guess what they discovered? You can smoke weed and it'll help with your anxiety. And then you got to smoke more and you got to smoke more. And then if you stop smoking, you have a new kind of anxiety that was worse than the first one you had that happens if you stop smoking weed. But it's not addictive. Just if you quit, you have anxiety. So the only answer is to keep doing more and more and more and more. But tell me how that's a performance enhancing drug. And I'm here to be your best friend. Look, if you got cancer and, and you can't eat and you smoke weed and it makes you eat and you're going to live longer, smoke weed. I don't care. I ain't here to argue about medicinal purpose. I just want to tell you that you and how you feel about your life is not a medicinal purpose. You should stop smoking weed so you feel right about your life. The reason you're depressed is because your life is depressing. The reason that you feel like your life sucks is because it sucks. And you smoke weed so you can pretend like it don't. That's how I'm feeling right now. I never drink when I'm mad. I will not have a drink of alcohol if I'm sad. I don't. Because it's a multiplier. I'm not suggesting that you do or don't drink. That's not my point. My point is I do not use substances to deal with my pain and my drama and my trauma. Uh, that's why I got saved. I don't think you heard me. I said, that's why I got saved. You know how I get healed? Going to Jesus. You know how I get unmad? Going to Jesus. Because he says, you want me to be mad at you? I'm like, no. Well, then forgive him. I'm like, well, can I be mad a few days? Mm -mm. All right. That's what I do. It's hard. And when I don't do what God says, I start feeling bad. Man, that would be a good time to get drunk. Should probably get high so I don't feel bad when I'm not doing what God says. Or maybe I should just feel bad because that's the gift of the Holy Spirit that brings conviction to your life. Not so you can numb it with weed or alcohol or whatever else you want it to do or being a workaholic or whatever you want to get out of proportion in your life. Maybe, maybe I ought to say, oh, why do I feel like this? Because you don't listen, bro, because you don't listen. Well, I feel like I'm bad. You, you are. You, you're holding unforgiveness. That's what happens. That's why I told you to forgive. Okay, I'm going to forgive. How do you feel? Better, but a little bit mad still. Okay, keep forgiving every day. Every day. That's the Christian life. It's not easy. Sorry I got so real so quick. Come tomorrow to be more refined. Self-esteem comes from who you are, whose you are, and what you do with what you have. You have value because you belong to Jesus, but your value is also based on what you do with what you've been given. The Bible has many stories like that. Where much is given, what? Much is required. The person who was given the most talents, the most was expected, right? So the more you have... Man, I'm so gifted, I'm called, God loves me, I'm so awesome. Good with that comes a lot of responsibility. Yeah. Spider-Man even said that. <laughs> too, <laughs> I'm on point tonight, guys. Too many people too easily change their identity according to their hobbies and friends. <laughs> I've told guys... You know, when you ride Harleys and stuff, people are into that. You know, they want to get all their black leather on and you know, tough. And a one percenter. How many people know what a one percenter is? How many people have no idea what that means? Yeah, good. You guys are good people. <laughs> Years ago, a law enforcement guy said 99% of people who ride motorcycles are just good people. But there's 1% that's the criminal element. They are the outlaws. So the outlaws said, thanks. We like that. We'll call ourselves one percenters. And they do to this day. So you know how many, you know what percent of bikers are one percenters, right? Well, it's less than 1%. <laughs> and I am not one of them. <laughs> Don't even pretend to be. But I've sat there before seeing people like normal, they, they have a good um, term. It's called a rub. A rub is a rich urban biker. That's what it stands for. It's not a nice term. And so I was sitting there one day and I was talking to this guy. So you're not even a real biker anyway, man. You're a poser. And the guy's sitting there and all these people are there and he goes, you're not a real biker. I said, oh, I know. I said, I'm a rub. And everybody started laughing. 
He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, I drive a nice car. I live in a house. I take showers every day. I don't break the law. If it's hot, I don't ride. If it's cold, I don't ride. If it looks like it might rain one day, I don't ride. Like, I'm not a real biker. And then it made him look stupid because he was pretending and I'm not. And then people say, hey, man, you're a biker. I'm like, no, I have a motorcycle. But, you know, one guy, even old guy told me one time, he saw my motorcycle in the garage and he said, hey, I'm from Milwaukee. I'm calling the cops. That's where Harleys are made. I said, why? He said, that bike has been sitting here so many days in a row. It's illegal to own a Harley and ride it that little. That's the kind of biker I am. Well, you have tattoos. Yes, I do. I don't own a tattoo shop. I don't use heroin. A lot of you don't know. Tattoos used to be to hide heroin marks, right? These are all Christian tattoos. What's the secret? Identity. What's my identity? Oh, you're a pastor. Wrong. Not even close. My identity is in Jesus because he made me and he saved me. He didn't just make me. He made me and he saved me. And then he said, give up everything. Take up your cross. It, let me show you how to do it. So my identity is him. So I'm trying to be like him. I want his approval more than anyone else's, except for when I'm stupid and I want my approval. How many people know what, you're talking, what I'm talking about? How many people do that? Sometimes you're like, I don't want to do what Jesus wants. I want to do what I want. And it's stupid. And then later you're like, why am I so stupid? I know better, right? But my identity is in Christ. I'm not a white Republican MAGA, you know, American, blah, 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 blah. I'm a Christian. I don't, even, I don't even like to use the word Christian because it brings up an idea in people's minds that's, that I'm not, that's not who I am. Because the definition of Christian is those who, don't, those who don't drink, smoke, or chew or go out with those who do. <laughs> or shoot pool. That was a huge thing in Christianity only until about 20 years ago. That if you shot pool, you could not be saved because that's where the devil worshippers hang out. <laughs> or the movie house. You go to the movie house, you got a demon. Okay, I'm not, whatever that is, I'm not that. The crazy dude who turned the whole world upside down, started a revolution that's still going on, that's the guy I'm following. He made everybody mad by doing it right. Man, sometimes I make everybody mad by doing it wrong, but I'm trying to make everybody mad by doing it right more. How many people are trying to do it right more? So I want to, my friend Dean, you know, Pastor Dean, he said, people ask him, what about you? He says, you know, he's just cool. He's like the opposite person of me, right? He's like, I'm, I'm a Jesus follower. And when you hear him say it, you're like, man, that's cool. But then you tell somebody else that, what do you do? I'm a Jesus follower. They're like, what the heck? You're like, no, that didn't come out right. I, uh, my, my friend's a Jesus follower. I'm, I'm some sort of Christian. I don't really know what kind I am because our church is weird. But think about it. If you fit in with the typical American Christian, you're probably not a take up your cross, win souls, make disciples kind of Christian. I do have a sermon and some points, <clears throat> but I'm trying to make a point. When people, sometimes people ask me when I'm out, they'll say, what do you do? And I tell them, I don't want to tell you yet. They say, what? And I said, let's wait a while and I'll tell you in an hour. Because listen, if I say I'm a pastor, everything changes in a second. So sometimes I wait and I'll tell them and then they're like, oh my gosh, my language. I'm like, trust me. Your language is the least offensive thing about you to God. You're like, I've been saying bad words. It's like, what about the content of what you've been saying? It's much worse than the bad words, right? And then some people, because I want to be shocking, I don't know why I do some of the things I do. They're like, what do you do? And I'm like, I'm a preacher, I don't know. I just don't, I don't like saying I'm a pastor of a Christian church. And then they go, oh, non-denominational. I go, yeah. <laughs> then they put me in my little box and then everybody goes their way. I hate that. Yeah. 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 
So, so when I was in Bali, I sat down and I met these people. I, it was, God does these crazy things. Next thing you know, I meet this guy. He's a famous influencer. He introduced me to the owner of the restaurant's girlfriend. She introduced me to her boyfriend who owns the restaurant. They introduced me to an architect from Australia who owns a port in Bali. So I'm hanging out with these people. I'm like, this is Jesus right here. This is crazy, right? And uh, the guy asked me, he goes, what do you do? I said, it's hard to explain. And he goes, really? I said, let me tell you what I've been doing the last couple of weeks. I was in Korobokan prison. He goes, wait, wait, wait. Korobokan? I said, yeah, I went there to go help the people there. He goes, what are you talking? He was like, guys, come here. He was in Korobokan. They were like, what were you doing there? I said, I was helping the guys. And then I went back and I was talking to them, helping them with their lives. And then they invited me to come back and talk to the women and the girl was like, you went to the women's prison? What were you telling them? I said, I started telling them how valuable they were to Jesus. And that God still has a plan for their life and that it's not over. That's what I do. I want to, I want, they were like, wow, what are you doing here in Bali? I said, I'm connected to a guy who's built 18 orphanages and 25 children's homes. See, that, my identity is following Christ. Remember what we were talking about? to be Jesus to the least of these. You know, I, I don't want you to put me in a box where now you know how to act around me. And then I found out the girl was Muslim. She prays five times a day, like she does the whole deal. And she said, I think it's so awesome what you are doing. Thank you for coming here. So maybe next time somebody asks you like, oh, you go to church, you could say, yeah, but you know what, I really, I love helping young people. What do you mean? Yeah, I have young people at my house every week. Well, who comes? Whoever wants to come. They bring their friends. We talk about the Bible. We teach them some stuff. And I pray for them. And I ask them about their lives. And I help them. Because that's what people who follow Jesus do. I'm a Christian. I go to Destiny Christian Church. I am a cell group leader. I'm a life group leader, I'm a worship leader, I'm an usher at my church. Those are all pictures of not who you are. What is your identity? Men, what do you, who are you? Tell me about yourself. Well, this is where I work, 20 years, that's right. Run my own business, this is what I do. That's not your identity, it's what you do. Is this helping anybody or we're just kind of just talking about what we don't want to do? <laughs> I'm talking about all the things that make me mad, so... They say, if you want to know what's close to your heart, figure out what makes you mad. Anybody can come here. We'll take the most broken, messed up people. They don't even have to repent. They can come. I mean, they obviously can't be a leader because they're not in a position to lead, but they can come. I don't care. Come. We'll tell you about Jesus every week. We'll worship right with you every single week. We'll pray for you every single week. Amen? So the title of the sermon... I'll just give you quick. We'll just fly through it, okay? I won't give it all to you. Come tomorrow. Come tomorrow. It's called, the series is called Identity. That's the name of the series. Identity. And who am I? Not me. Who are you? Genesis 127 and 28. I love this. So God created man in his own image. Whose image? His. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. How good is that? You know, that's who I am. Is that who you are? Made in the image of God, do you recognize that? Like I'm made in God's image. He made me and he saved me. Amen? Um, now God has a clear concept of us that we have to believe. He has an idea. I was talking to Pastor Dean, it's pretty cool. I was talking to Pastor Dean and David Curry, remember David Curry, his brother, the leader of uh, Global Christian Relief. So we're sitting on the porch looking over the Puget Sound at Pastor Dean's house, it was awesome. Hanging him out, talking about all kinds of stuff. And I said something to Pastor Dean and he said, he was talking about Casey Treat and he said, Casey doesn't talk like that. Casey Treat's one of my heroes, I love Casey Treat. He's also a friend of mine, but I think he's the greatest. He's the best. And I said, what do you mean? He says, yeah, Casey said that he never wants to say anything 
that he doesn't want because he doesn't want his spirit to hear it. I'm going to say that again. He never says anything that he doesn't want or he doesn't want to happen. He never says it out loud because he doesn't want his spirit to hear it. And I was like, yeah, he's pretty good, I guess. He says some good stuff. I mean, all of his books and leadership stuff that I've read, it's all been all right, you know. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? The natural man, this is what Casey says, the natural man always says what he doesn't want. The super, supernatural man says what he wants. So how can we be supernatural? By considering who do I, who am I? Who do I think I am? How do I see myself? Because if I see myself made in the image of God and saved by Jesus, and he said, come follow me, then I should start, that should be my primary identity. Not I'm a white Christian. I'm a Christian who happens to be white. Guys, I'm not racist. When I go through the airport, I hate everyone of every color. <laughs> because they're all in my way. It's like they immediately go in the airport and that x-ray gives them a lobotomy and nobody knows how to like step off to the side to stop. They all stop right in the walkway. Has anybody ever been in an airport? You know what? I found myself doing something weird this week. I was just yesterday. I was going through the airport and I was humming. Mm-hmm. 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 and I was doing this and my teeth were clenched and I was like mm-hmm. and I realized I was trying to calm myself by humming I was like that's a little psychotic like didn't I tell you that I was like Annie it was weird I was like humming through the airport and then I wondered how often do I do that so if you're in my way and you're here humming step to the side but I, I, don't, I don't get that I, I'll never be more white than I am Christian and, and check this out. This might not be popular. I'll never be more American than I am Christian. I'm never going to be anything more than I'm Christian. I'm Christian first. I am a Christ follower first. You want to know my identity? I am with Jesus. He's with me. That's it. That's who I am. And whenever you let something get in front of that, now your identity is going to create problems for you. Hmm. I videoed people running with a gay pride flag in front of my hotel so they could put it in the thing and they could all run around and do calisthenics because they were working out. And I thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a flag that has my sexual preference, something that I really like about sex. I'm going to put it on a flag and run out there and put it down and do exercises, because everybody wants to know what kind of sex I want to have, right? Nobody does, right? I'm just making sure. Guys, we like to have sex like this. No, we're going to exercise. That's their identity. Their whole identity is stupid. Well, first of all, it's against the Bible. It's demonic. Pride got Lucifer cast out of heaven. Surprise, that's the name of their month. Weird. So I thought my mic cut out. I was like, it's the devil. He's trying to stop me. <laughs> but what, what, that's their identity. Like that's their whole world. Yeah. I have to let everybody know. Who cares? A friend of mine just wrote on Facebook. He said, what you do and who you have sex with is none of my business. You talking to my kids about it is my only business. How many people do not care what people do at their house? Do it. Don't wear a shirt or carry a flag to let us know what it is because we don't care. I think that's why they're mad because we don't care. What's your identity? In Christ. I'm in Christ. You can't talk to me and not get to that point somewhere in the conversation. I will never deny Jesus. I'll never try to pretend like I'm not a pastor. I don't do that. I do try to not let that get brought up at the front of the conversation because I hate how it affects connecting with people, but I'm not going to get out of there and not tell people they're going to find out. Amen. I was at a biker bar one time. Don't try to copy some of the things I do. I don't know why I do what I do, but I got me a cigar. I got a drink. It was on a Sunday. It was after church. I was like, man, I'm done. I'm so tired. I'm just going to relax here. And Annie's like, yeah, just relax. I was like, yeah, good. And then this guy comes up, Rick. 
I don't know if you know, that's not my name. My name is Rich. Rick, come here. Now I'm being summoned by a large steroided guy who doesn't know my name. I said, Annie, I'll be right back. <laughs> I was like. He goes, come here, Rick. Puts his arm around me. Takes me to a group of 10 people. They're all standing there, bikers. And he says, guys, this is Rick. He's a pastor. They're like, cool. He goes, pastor, it's Sunday. Give us the good word. Did, am I lying? This, 100%, right? And this is in the middle of a bar, bands playing. It's outside, but the bands play, it's loud. And I said, I don't wanna hold everybody captive here. You guys don't have to do that. It's, it's okay. All of them said, no, it's okay. Give us two or three minutes. Come on, really, go ahead. All of them, every single person. Come on. I was like, all right, Jesus, I get it. I'm not off duty. I guess it's still technically Sunday. So I said, you know, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, the Lord brought them to, to the bitter waters. And I just started telling them that. And they were like, what? And I said, and he threw in wood. That wood represents the cross. And it took the bitterness out. And the, the water became sweet. And that means mirror. You could see yourself in that water who God's called you to be. They were never meant to stay there. They were supposed to learn something from God and move on. The Lord doesn't want you stuck in your life and your traumatic events. I, that fast, guys, I told them. They were like, that's so good. And my friend says, can you pray for us? And they all get in a huddle. Yeah, pray for us. Now I'm crying and praying for these people. And they're like, thanks so much. We don't want to keep you. Go ahead. I was like, well, we forgot to take up an offering. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> Usually that, I mean, not every time, but, you know. And I walked away, and he keeps me coming back with tears. I said, I don't know if Jesus did that for them or for me, but that was one of the greatest moments of my life. Because that's who we are. Guys, we have something in us to give somebody else. That's who I am. Stop letting the world dictate your identity. You love Jesus. He made you. He saved you. Follow him. And if we start identifying with him, guess what? We're going to be way more successful in the things that he's called us to do. Amen? I didn't even get to my verses. I'm going to read these verses as a preview so you'll come tomorrow. Exodus chapter 3, verse 10 to 14. I'm going to read you these few verses. It's about Moses. That's what you're going to get tomorrow. Not tonight. Don't panic. Because Moses is, a, is an example of low self-esteem. And he didn't have good self-image. Come now, therefore, this is what the Lord's telling him. I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Most people would say, let's go. Moses said to God, who am I? There's the question. Who am I? Wrong question. Who am I? You're not bringing them out because of who you are. <laughs> who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, the Lord said, I will certainly be with you. And this will be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he says, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. How many people notice that God does not have an identity crisis? What do I tell him your name is? Bro, I am who I am. My name is, I'm here, check me out. That's my name. Like eternity just touched your world and had a conversation with you. And when I'm telling you what we're going to do, you don't bring your little measly life as an excuse why I can't do that through you. I can do anything and you can do anything that I choose to do through you. Amen. Amen. 
It doesn't matter who you are or what you have or don't have. When the Lord says, I am, and I will go with you, and I will do it through you, we just say, okay, everything that you are more than makes up for what I'm not. Amen? And we start to shift our identity. Moses started to get it. Because remember, we read later, man, and he's an animal. He's a monster. Moses is like full of faith. The Red Sea's like, oh, get my rod. Boom, there it is. Red Sea's opening. That's insane. How could someone do that? Because he walked with God. His identity started to change from, I'm just a guy who tried to do it on my own, to a guy who met the one who's the great I am who said, I want to do it through you. And when he started identifying with him, boom, he became a man of faith and God started using him for incredible things. That's what we're going to do. So we're going to go on this journey through these next weeks, probably five or six weeks, talking about our identity and who we are in Christ, identifying with him. That doesn't mean we're all going to be the same as each other, but however he made you to be, whoever he made you to be, you're going to be like him in your life. You're going to be the one who's following Jesus. And when I am says, I want to use you, you're not going to start making excuses. You're going to say, well, I could probably choose other people. But since you chose me, you must be able to do it. Amen? So I want you to start to think about that. Like I said, if you want to come tomorrow, I'll go through these things really good. Tonight you just got the... You got the shotgun tonight, because I've been thinking about this a lot, huh, Annie? We've been talking about it a lot, so you just got the, you know, whatever. We'll blame it on jet lag. I don't know how long I can be jet lag, but I'll work it as long as I can. <laughs> but I want us to understand that our identity is in Christ. Let's be like him. Less like us, more like him. Like John said, I must decrease, he must increase. Amen? All right, come on, let's be standing. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for this night and every person that's here. And Lord, thank you for all the things that we talked about. Holy Spirit, take those things and touch each heart what you have for each person. That in Jesus' name, we would all identify with you. Because we proclaim that you alone are good. And you are worthy to be worshipped and to be praised. All of our faith and our hope is in you. It's not in ourselves. Lord, we've already learned not to trust ourselves. So we look to you. Thank you, Lord, that you created us in your image and your likeness. Thank you that you made us in your image. Thank you, Lord, that you created us for dominion and that you invited us to follow you. You said, take up your cross and follow me. Lord, let us be those kind of Christians that that's our identity. We identify with you. We identify with your death. Come on, guys, we got to die to ourselves. And we also identify with your resurrection so we can live the resurrected life for your glory. Use us for your glory. Lord, over these next weeks, I pray in the name of Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would break off the arguments in our mind and the things that try to chain us to our past. Come on, receive that in Jesus' name. You are not who you were. You're not who you used to be. The Lord brought you out so he could bring you in. He brought them out of Egypt so he could bring them into the promised land. They were not the same people when they got there. The Lord brought you out so he could renew you and bring you in in Jesus' name. You are made in the image of God. And when the Lord thinks about you, he thinks in positive ways and he sees your future. He sees your destiny. He sees your purpose and everything that he sees the Father sees through the blood of his son, Jesus. And he sees us as holy because of what Jesus did for us. Lord, we receive that tonight. Forgive us for our negative thoughts. Forgive us for trying to pattern our image after the world or those in the world. But we truly want to be like you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, praise the Lord. I don't know if I preached you happy, but I preached me happy tonight. I'm happy. I feel good right now. I feel like, man, we could do anything for Jesus. We really can because of who he is. And he called us. He called you, right? He says, the Lord says, you didn't choose me. I chose you.
He chose you. He must believe in you. Isn't that good? Yeah, let's be those kind of Christians. If you're here tonight and you've never given your life to Jesus before, we want to give you a chance to do that. And Everything we're talking about tonight, you know, man has sinned. The Bible says all have sinned. All of us. We've all sinned. The Bible says the wages of sin or what you earn because of your sin is death. And that's not talking about just dying. It's talking about dying and being separated from God for all of eternity. And it's not because he hates you. It's because sin can't live in the presence of God. So you wouldn't be allowed into the presence of God. And you think, well, why would the Lord make me and just want to send me to hell? He doesn't want to send you to hell. That's why our Heavenly Father sent Jesus. And a lot of people know that Jesus, they hear Jesus died for me, but they don't know why. Well, he died because he's the only one who had no sin. So he's the only one who could pay our price. See, our sin cost us death, which is hell. Jesus came with no sin, so he took our place. Everything he went through was what we deserved. They took him, stripped him of his clothes, strapped him to a post, beat him with the whip, ripped his flesh from his body. That's what we deserved. But he did that in our place. And the Bible says by his stripes, that beating, we are healed. He did that for our healing. Then they put the cross on his back. He carried it to Calvary. When he got there, they stretched him out and they put nails in his hands and in his feet. They raised him up and he hung there suffering. That's what we deserved. He did that in our place for us. Every sin, every evil thought, every evil word, every evil action, Jesus paid the price for it on the cross. And then he died. They took him down from the cross. They put him in a tomb. And when they went there on the third day, he wasn't there. He was raised from the dead. And Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you believe that in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, you will be saved. What's it mean to be saved? It means when you die, you're not going to hell, you're going to heaven. That's good news. That's why it's called the gospel. That's good news. But guess what? You don't have to wait till heaven to experience Jesus. He will come and live inside of you right now. He will forgive you for your sins. Your guilt and shame can be broke, broken off, can be taken away. Your old life can be broken off. You can start a new life today in Jesus. You can be who he called you to be. So if you've never given your life to Jesus before and you want to do that tonight, I want to pray for you. If that's you, just raise your hand right where you're at. And I'll pray for you to give your life to Jesus. So when you die, you can go to heaven. Anybody here tonight? If you died tonight, and you're not sure if you died tonight that you would go to heaven. Because we need to know. This is our eternity. If you're not sure you would go to heaven if you died tonight, I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. Anybody here tonight? Anybody here tonight, you just really want to go to hell. You're like, you know what? Sounds good. Well, there's only two choices, guys. Accept Jesus or you have to accept the punishment for your sins. Don't do that. Don't do that. If you're here tonight, maybe you're here tonight and you used to live for the Lord. You used to go to church, but you're not going now. You're not serving him now. You haven't been going for a while. Maybe you went when you were younger, but you're here tonight and say, man, I want to start living for Jesus again. If that's you, you can rededicate your life and start living for the Lord. You could do that right now. Anybody need to rededicate? I'll pray for you. If you need to rededicate tonight. Everybody's good. Ask the person next to you if they're good. Ask them, are you good? If you're saved, raise your hand. If you're saved, give your life to Jesus, raise your hand. Raise it where I can see it or I'm going to make you raise it to get saved. Raise your hand if you're saved. I'm going to make sure we're 100%. Good, 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 good. Okay, put your hands down. I just want to make sure I can blame it on you why nobody's getting saved tonight. You better bring your friends. Come on. How many people do your friends need to hear that tonight? How many people in the world do you know? I'm not trying to preach to you again. I'm pastoring you a little bit. How many people do you know right now that are struggling with their identity? We, I barely brought up Pride Month. That's about identity. People are trying to find their identity. Most of those people have been abused when they were children. There's, those people need help. We need to love them. Think of all the people struggling with their identity right now in the world. Bring your friends. Jesus is the answer to whatever their problem is. Amen? 
All right, come on, let's pray. Let's get out of here. Father, thank you so much for this night. Thank you for every person. Lord, bless us and help us to remember that we are Christ followers, that we are following you because you made us and you saved us. And we want to be like you. Let our identity be fixed in you. We love you. Let us be a blessing to every person we come in contact with. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give the Lord praise. Go in victory. Get out of here.